and good morning and Merry Christmas. We are so glad that you are sharing this special day with us this morning on Wake Up Wiregrass. I'm Amanda Arnold. It is December 25th. And let's check in now with meteorologist Oscar Fan for a look at our Christmas weather beginning to feel a lot like Christmas out there. Oscar? Yeah, I'll take the June feeling of Christmas myself. Uh, <laughs> It is cold. We had a slight west-southwest wind that has kept the temperatures in the upper 20s around 30 degrees. As far as your Christmas Day forecast, nothing beats a model railroad train while we're moving around the Christmas tree. Hope you have good family, good friends, good conversations, good times, and of course, good food. Uh, 28 around 7 this morning, then around 40 as we get into the noonday hours. Winds will pick up at times today up to near 20 miles an hour, but generally will be around 15 miles an hour out of the northwest. And then we'll settle down to not much wind tonight, less than 10 miles an hour, and temperatures will be 36 at 5, but we're headed to a low of around 23 to 25 on Saturday morning. We'll have the full weather coming up in a few minutes. Amanda. All right, Oscar, thank you so much. Well, in anticipation of this Christmas Day, WDHN wanted to hear about your favorite holiday traditions. Here's reporter Allison O'Connor with the story. Christmas Wiregrass, every family has its own traditions that they follow during the holiday season. Here are some of your favorites throughout the city of Dothan. First up is a Christmas game many have played at parties or family gatherings, the Saran Wrap Ball Game. Local Sandy Hodge explained her family plays this game every Christmas and even gets competitive with it. We get in a big circle around the table and of course you're rolling as fast as you can. That's where it gets loud and it gets, we start throwing the ball, and, but it, it is a ton of fun. It is a ton of fun, especially if you have competitive people in your family and we do. Besides games, many said cooking and baking was a huge part of their traditions during the holidays, which all leads up to getting together with their loved ones for a family meal. Uh, my favorite holiday tr tradition now for years has been with my wife's entire family on Christmas Eve, uh, gathering at her brother's barn and doing uh, a hayride and a fabulous meal with way more food than 20 something people could eat. Mr. Hill explained that although traditions have changed for this year, he looks forward to making new memories. Here's one tradition that you probably won't see anywhere except Southeast Alabama, fireball throwing. The fireball is made out of fabric and twine and is soaked in kerosene for two months and lit on Christmas Eve or Christmas night by the bachelor family. So that was the only toy my mother and her siblings had was the fireball. And they'd get an apple and orange, they said, and then they'd play with the fireball. And so when my mother had children, uh, she just always made fireballs for us. And every Christmas Eve or Christmas night, whenever we could all get together, we threw the fireball. So whatever traditions you follow, WDHN wishes you and your family a happy holiday season. Covering local news first in Dothan, I'm Allison O'Connor, WDHN News. And also in the Christmas spirit, senior living facilities who make their residents feel so special, especially this time of year. WDHN Sarah Wilson spoke to some of the residents at Whitehall in Dothan, and here's her story. All our friends and family. The pandemic has put a damper on some Christmas joy, but the Whitehall Assisted Living Facility is spreading that joy by putting together a special Christmas dinner, gift exchanges, decorated the facility, and Santa came to visit them. Residents were overjoyed. The people here is real nice. They try to do everything in the world to help you out. These ladies work so hard to take care of us every day. We have been very fortunate in not having any virus problems because of them. So, uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everybody. I'm Sybil Smith, and words cannot express the love and time that's been spent. I am very happy and pleased to be here at Whitehall. It's such a good place to be, and I've never regretted one minute of my time that I've been here. Whitehall officials are happy to show their love to their residents and wishes everyone a very Merry Christmas. Covering local news first in Dothan, Sarah Wilson, WDHN News. 
Oh, yes, indeed. Well, unfortunately, Christmas holiday travel got off to an awful start for two drivers on Thursday just before noon. A two-vehicle head-on collision happened along the Coffee-Crenshaw County line outside of Brantley. It involved a tractor trailer and a car on State Highway 189 North in the Bullock community. The Elba Fire Department responded to the mutual aid call and then emergency responders had to use extricating equipment to get a passenger out of the vehicle. That individual with reportedly serious injuries was taken by ambulance to an area trauma center. And so far, no additional information has been released. We'll keep you posted on that. Certainly not all is well this Christmas after a fire yesterday morning in Houston County where the Parr home caught fire and the family barely escaped the flames with just the clothes on their backs. Oh, so sadly, the fire claimed four of their five dogs. Northside Methodist Academy has started a GoFundMe page to help this family, and that can be found by searching for the Parr Family House Fire. A Crenshaw County man faces attempted murder charges after ramming a deputy's vehicle off the road. It started Wednesday night when a vehicle began following a deputy's patrol car. The deputy turned on his emergency lights to cause separation from the pursuing car, but Covington County Sheriff Blake Truman says the driver, Dalton Greer, hit the back of the squad vehicle on U.S. Highway 29. Sheriff says Greer repeatedly slammed into the patrol car until he forced it off the road. After the deputy's patrol car got stuck in the mud, Greer returned and started ramming the patrol car in the side before he ran away. The suspect was later arrested at his home in Crenshaw County. Greer is spending this Christmas Day in Crenshaw County Jail without bond. The Blakely Police Department is searching for a woman connected to a jewel theft. The department said the theft happened Wednesday just before noon at Brown Jewelers. If you know this person or have any information about what happened here, you're asked to call the Blakely Police Department at 229-723-3414. And now to coronavirus news. What's causing this holiday to be so different this year? Here's the COVID-19 threat level that remains high, just as the wiregrass is beginning to celebrate Christmas. The Alabama Department of Public Health states that Henry and Houston counties join Dale County in the very high risk level. Henry County's percent of positive COVID-19 tests rose to 13.92% while Houston County rose to 13.35%. Dale County remains very high risk, but its percentage dropped to 12.83%. The wiregrass is still lower, though, than the state average, which rose to 16.4% last week. Meanwhile, as Congress and the president wrangle over financial details of the coronavirus relief bill, Alabama retailers say regardless of the final measure, help is needed now. According to Nancy Dennis with the Alabama Retail Association, money from the Paycheck Protection Program earlier this year was a lifeline for many small businesses. Dennis says any stimulus checks and more loans for businesses are critical to not just keeping the economy afloat headed into 2021, but also to set it up for a strong recovery. We touch every aspect of daily living. So you buy your food, you buy your drugs, you buy your, um, your gifts, you buy your, um, you know, all kinds of things you buy that you use on a daily basis, you buy from retailers. Dennis says even the move to more online and personal shopping services will help businesses as they begin to recover in a post-pandemic economy. Well, a 27-year-old drive through Christmas tradition is continuing in the City of Progress. Nearly 3 million lights illuminate Christmas in the woodlands. 
and the Trawick family on the Boll Weevil Circle continually adds to this winter wonderland. On average, more than 25,000 vehicles come through this Yuletide extravaganza every year, the busiest times being on Thanksgiving night and Christmas Eve. Educator Trent Trawick says his dad, Milton, started the tradition because he loved seeing and hearing the children express their amazement. Just an enterprise, but the wiregrass and other states uh, have has driven and supported us over the years. That's what kept it going, and, and that's what will keep it going as long as they continue to support. Now, there's no fee to drive through and enjoy this Christmas in the woodlands, but donations are accepted to help defray that hefty electric bill. This nightly show continues through New Year's Eve, but we're told it could end sooner depending on the weather, and that's where... Mr. Fan, the weatherman, comes in. Oscar's holiday forecast and looking back at the Elba flood from five years ago, plus more Christmas and Enterprise, sports, and our studio guest this morning with special insight on getting through these tough times. All ahead, do stay with us. This weather segment is sponsored by Physicians Hearing Center. You're watching WDHN's First Alert Weather. And Oscar Fan Info Meteorologist Ted King. He'll be back with you on Monday. As far as your talking points for this cold morning, temperatures for the most part in the upper 20s. Look for sunny, cold, breezy conditions today. And then tonight, very cold. The temperature dropped to the mid 20s for Saturday morning. But it looks like the winds will be around 10 or less as we go through the overnight hours. But today, still up near 20 miles an hour at times, but not an all day windy affair. Uh, but they will be noticeable, especially with those temperatures struggling to get to 43. Over the weekend, sunny and a chilly Saturday, upper 40s Saturday with sun. And then on Sunday, we'll get to around the mid 50s. And overnight lows Sunday morning will be in the upper 20s. And then we should be around freezing, maybe slightly above that as we get into early next week and then into the 40s as we head into the middle of the week. So the next cold front and rain will be right at the end of the month. That'll be Wednesday, more like late afternoon into evening, overnight into early Thursday. 
And then January the 1st, Friday, should be sunny and cooler. And again, a Merry Christmas to everyone out there. As far as what we're looking at right now, we're at 30 degrees. Notice that wind west-southwest. Uh, that's a little bit of a reaction to a dry cold front moving down from the north. It's going to fall apart as we go through the morning hours, but it is inducing a west-southwest wind. That has held the temperature up a couple of degrees in quite a few areas. And you see what we're looking around the area. Do you see those upper 20s to low 30s? So it's about a degree or two above what we anticipated, but we did not anticipate that west-southwest wind. This is what we're looking at national temperatures, cold around the western Great Lakes and up the eastern seaboard. You notice it is a noticeably mild up in New England, but that's because the front hasn't moved through that area yet. Uh, they'll get their due desserts as far as that cold air in the next few hours. And you see temperatures pretty much in the eastern part of the country on the chilly side. What we're looking at as far as the radar, you can see the activity has moved off, had some strong to severe thunderstorm warnings in parts of Georgia, eastern Georgia and the Carolinas, where there was a tornado watch in the coastal area of the Carolinas. As far as what we're looking at nationally, good news out here in the desert southwest, uh, they, they depend on two times of the year to get rain. That is in the summer thunderstorm season, which is like late July into August, and then also winter rains. And they're finally getting some for the first time this season. So that is indeed good news for those folks. And see things are drying out for us. The next system will take shape in the middle part of the country as we get into the next week. Hour by hour, nothing to show you. Just want to show you that there is completely rain free as we go through the next two to three days. And really it will last all the way into probably late Wednesday afternoon, the dry trend, but the clouds will start Start to show up later in the day on Tuesday. Your local forecast looking for 43 for high, sunny, cold, windy at times. Winds occasionally getting up to 20 in gusts, but for the most part will be around 12 to 15, and then they'll start to diminish toward late afternoon. And the extended forecast in tonight, 40. Oh, let's see what I hit the oh, 24 for low, low to mid 20s, and then as we get into the extended. Slow warm up, especially as we get into Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in the 60s, but more clouds on Wednesday with rain developing either in the afternoon or Wednesday night into early Thursday. So, all in all, nice forecast over the next several days. But again, today would be a good day for indoor activity, uh, enjoying some of the Christmas gifts or some of the old Christmas movies or the, like the tie I have on, I'll show you again next time. The Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas from 1965. Any of those would be good viewing. And also on a cold day like today, you'll enjoy that heat. Be careful how you use your heat indoors. Make sure any flammable objects are away from a fireplace or space heaters or anything like that. Amanda? Excellent advice, Oscar. Thank you so much. Five years ago last evening, it was Christmas Eve when residents in Elba were forced to watch as excessive rains poured into nearby water systems and caused the Pea River to swell. As the days wore on, the river would creep higher and higher, eventually swelling to over 40 feet. WDHN's Paige Weeks talked recently with Elba residents and officials who were there during that historic crest. 41.42 feet. That's how high the Pea River was in December of 2015. The event has since been dubbed as the Christmas flood of 2015. Governor Bentley came down. I believe the National Guard was here. I know the Corps of Engineers was here um, assisting city crews monitor and walk the levee. During that time, city residents and employees worked together, preparing low-lying homes and businesses for flooding. It was a job that lasted several days. Our employees worked 24 hours a day providing sandbags to residents and helping some of them move to higher ground. Current Elba Mayor Tom Maddox lives in Brookdale, one of the areas most prone to flooding. At the time, not only was he concerned about his home, but also his business, which sits in the downtown square just below the levee. It had been uh, flooded a couple of times in the past. Uh, we did take some precautions. A niece and her family had driven up with the trailer and a pickup truck and they were ready to, to help me move some stuff. After this levee held up back in 2015, some Elba residents say they have an increased trust in both its strength and its ability. My family and, and people that I associate with feel very confident in the levee. Of course, we can't control the water if we have enough water to come over the top of the levee, but the levee, I, I believe, is, is going to keep us safe. Covering local news first in Elba, Paige Weeks, WDHN News. And moving now to Enterprise, Mayor William Cooper was joined by employees from across the city of Progress in wishing that city a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Report 
summons you to have a happy holiday and a peaceful new year. Merry Christmas! Greetings from Enterprise Fire Department. We are all fired up. We wish you a safe and joyous holiday. Happy holidays and happy landings in the new year from the Enterprise Municipal Airport. All right, definitely in the Christmas spirit there. And that was only part of their holiday wishes. You can visit the city's Facebook page to get that full greeting. Well, coming up, Auburn's new football coach speaks out about his plans for special things along the way. And two Alabama star players now officially among the four Heisman Trophy contenders. Sports news and much more coming up next. But first, a look outside, courtesy of the Durden Digital Cam, now overlooking Troy, Alabama, looking very Christmassy, if a bit foggy out there this Christmas morning. It's 620. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. You're watching WDHN Sports. Merry Christmas, sports fans. Thursday afternoon brought an early Christmas present for Alabama Crips and Tide football fans. The four final Heisman finalists were released on ESPN, and two Alabama stars made that list. Junior quarterback Mac Jones is a Heisman hopeful after he's put together one of the best 11-game seasons we've seen in the SEC, throwing 3,800 yards and 32 touchdowns. And one of the guys that made him look so good this year is a finalist as well. That is Bama star wideout Devontae Smith, and he's been on another level in 2020, totaling 1,500 receiving yards to go along with 17 touchdowns. And joining them is another SEC quarterback, Florida's Kyle Trask. He's led the nation in passing yards and passing touchdowns. And then certainly not least, not last, Trevor Lawrence. He will be trying to win his first Heisman Trophy ever, which is hard to believe. And speaking of early Christmas presents, yesterday Auburn's brand new head coach, Brian Harson addressed the media as he learned pretty quick how to make these Auburn fans smile. War Eagle. War Eagle. 
feels good to say that. He said War Eagle about 35 times throughout that 40 minute presser. And let me tell you, you're getting a winner, Tiger Nation. You see with the record he's compiled 69 wins to 19 losses, but it's also the way he carries himself. And you can tell that every day he thinks that's a day that his team can get better. He's a family man, an intense man. And before he got into how he plans on winning, he wanted to just say thank you and what the job means to him. It means, it means so much to be standing here as Auburn's head football coach and to be a part of this university and this program. And it's been an incredible journey, um, a lot of uh, incredible memories uh, to get here. And certainly what I found through this process is there's tremendous and special people that are in this program and we plan to do special things along the way. Parson doesn't just win games, he's won three Mountain West Conference championships, and that's going to stay in the history books over at Boise State. But now he moves to the SEC where things are going to get a little bit tougher. But with Auburn, you get a little bit better recruits. But he's going to see teams like Alabama, of course. you got the Iron Bowl and then LSU and Texas A&M all in their division. And in order to win games, conference titles, or even national championships, the road to get there comes from the input each unit will have to provide every single day. And that worth that ethic and class in which his team carries themselves is going to impress him more than the rings they're able to win. And when that winning comes, it's the fashion Auburn will do it in that matters to Harson. But it's really simple. We want to win championships and we want to do it a certain way. We want to do it with class. We want to do it with integrity and we want to do it with academic excellence. Because these guys are student athletes and through this football program, we will win, but we will do it the right way. And we will have guys here that truly enjoy the journey while they're with us. Well, when you take a job at Auburn, you know you're going to get asked about Alabama, the Iron Bowl, and now Nick Saban, of course, with that November game looming every single year. And his response to the first question he was asked about them was pretty standard, just saying that each game represents the same value to the team. But he did say this about what Nick Saban's done at Alabama. As far as Coach Saban, um, you know, he is, he's done a tremendous job. Uh, much, much respect for me for what he's been able to do and uh, the type of programs he's put together. So, uh, I've got nothing other than respect for him and, and what they've done, and, and I'm certainly looking forward to competing against him. And uh, we'll have our opportunity to do that, but we're going to focus on what we need to do at Auburn and, and how we need to do it so we can put ourselves in a position to, to compete when it's time. All right, well, that's going to be the, it, the end of Christmas sports on this day. Thanks for allowing us into your home on such a special day. Go out, have some good day with some family, watch some sports, eat some good food. But all in the end, have a merry, merry Christmas. And as you can see in the picture here, a lot of dogs have short hair, so they kind of enjoy the warmth of the inside of the house. Uh, please, if they have an outside dog in the course of use outside, kind of cold out there, so have a, like a laundry room or somewhere, and they can get away from the wind and keep fresh water available to them. Otherwise, I hope you and your pet companions enjoy the holidays. 43 for a high today, sunny, cold, windy at times, uh, but slowly warming up as we get into the latter part of the weekend. And again, a Merry Christmas to you and your furry companions. Amanda? <laughs> All right, Oscar, thank you. When Wake Up Wiregrass continues in our next half hour, Christmas greetings from Governor Kay Ivey and her favorite holiday tradition. What Alabama retailers want for Christmas, help now. Former foster kitten Sam wants a new home and maybe a new name for Christmas. And our studio guest this morning, Tim Mayhall, Southeast Health's Director of Spiritual Care, has some thoughts about getting through this COVID Christmas. Do stay with us. We'll be right back.
Good morning and a very Merry Christmas to you and yours. We're so glad you're joining us for this special edition of Wake Up Wiregrass. I'm Amanda Arnold. It is December 25th. And let's go over now to meteorologist Oscar Fan filling in for Ted King. And a Merry Christmas to you, Oscar, on this frosty morn. <laughs> Uh, definitely a very cold morning and same to you Amanda. I hope everyone's having a Merry Christmas out there and indeed staying warm and safe. This is what we're looking at as far as your Christmas Day forecast. Uh, love that model train going around the Christmas tree. That was always one of my best favorite presents to get as a model train. Where did they ever go? Uh, as far as today looking at the highs get up around 43. Winds will exert themselves at times. You'll notice that probably in the late morning or early afternoon in case of getting up to near 20 miles an hour generally be around 15 miles an hour, but just adding a little tinge of cold to the already frigid conditions out there for today. Overnight lows tomorrow morning will be around 25 degrees. We'll have the full weather coming up in a few minutes, Amanda. All right, Oscar, thank you. Well, Governor Ivey expressed her Christmas greeting and wishes for all Alabamians. And with all the difficulties of 2020, she said that she hopes people will enjoy the spirit of Christmas wherever they are. She wished the entire state a Christ-like Merry Christmas and shared her favorite family tradition reading with family and friends in the Bible, the Christmas story in the book of Matthew, where the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, and the angel sent a star to guide the shepherds to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And the governor continued with her story of Jesus' birth. She called it the greatest story in the history of mankind. Well, meanwhile, the story in Washington is on pause as Congress and the president will continue wrangling next week over financial details of the coronavirus relief bill. But Alabama retailers say no matter what the outcome, help is needed now. Here's state capital reporter Jeff Sanders with the story from Montgomery. Coronavirus relief bill will be a shot in the arm for retailers and small businesses in Alabama, but they say it's money that's needed now to help turn the economy around for 2021. Nancy Dennis with the Alabama Retail Association says whatever is in the final bill is needed in Alabama. Clothing retailers, restaurants, um, when you can't operate a restaurant at full capacity, um, that's just not built into their business model. Dennis says hundreds of billions of dollars in paycheck protection loans approved earlier this year have proved to be a lifeline. We touch every aspect of daily living. So you buy your food, you buy your drugs, you buy your, um, your gifts, you buy your, um, you know, all kinds of things you buy that you use on a daily basis, you buy from retailers. Dennis says with businesses shut down, workers who lost their jobs are struggling. Congresswoman Terry Sewell says the relief bill can't wait any longer. I know how hard it is for um, Alabama families that I represent uh, to keep food on the table during this holiday season. But whenever financial relief comes, that, along with a vaccine, brings hope for 2021. While they know, realize it won't be immediate, that we aren't back to normal media, immediately, but they can see that. They can see that now. They can see that that's going to happen. Dennis also says the move this year to more online and personal shopping services could help retailers next year in a changing economy post pandemic. Covering local news first in Montgomery, Jeff Sanders, WDHN News. And the $2,000 COVID relief proposal was denied in the House, but lawmakers will have another chance to approve it or something when they meet again in Washington next week. Well, the billion nine hundred billion dollar COVID relief package that would issue uh, about six hundred dollars to Americans, giving some relief that many have been looking for for a long time, is stalled. President Donald Trump has since demanded that that amount be raised to two thousand dollars instead. And then Thursday night, lawmakers voted against that increase, leaving many residents who were depending on those funds still out in the cold, so to speak. One resident hurt by this outcome thinks lawmakers need to focus more on the people. Everybody needs help. And right now it's getting worse instead of better. And I wish they'd just put the politicians aside, worry about the American people. And again, that $2,000 COVID relief proposal denied in the House last night. And lawmakers will get another go at it or something when they decide to meet again in Washington next week. 
Well, with the holidays in full swing, reporter Trevor Alt looks at traveling in the year of COVID, who's hitting the road, and where the most traffic is expected to be. We're expecting to see an impact on the roads this holiday season. AAA says it will likely be down about 25%, but that would still mean as many as 81 million Americans out there on the road, and 4 in 10 say they're going far enough to cross state lines. It's enough to have an impact everywhere, though some regions are going to have it a little bit worse than others. The Rocky Mountains had the highest percentage of people who say they're traveling at 40 percent. The Southwest, the Southeast, the Pacific all say they are not very far behind. The Midwest says they only have about 31 percent of people traveling, and the smallest percentage is in the Northeast at 27 percent of people, so only about one in four there in the Northeast. It depends on both the time of day and the specific day. Atlanta, Boston, and Houston are all expecting their peak, peak traffic congestion on Saturday late in the afternoon, so that would be the day after Christmas. Washington, D.C. isn't expected to hit theirs until Monday morning at about 11.30, with then Los Angeles and New York in the two days that follow around 5 o'clock, the 29th and the 30th, Tuesday and Wednesday. But really, in all the larger urban areas across the country, you could see traffic as long as three times longer than what you usually would. Having said that, there's still going to be about 27 million fewer Americans who are are out traveling on the roads for the holiday, so you might be able to cruise through a little bit faster than you have in years past. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. And closer to home, just in time for Christmas, Samson's Good Hope Mount Olive Community Baptist Church provided a holiday dinner for nearly 100 residents of mainly western Geneva and eastern Coffee counties. Organizers say providing food for those who have to do without is truly a blessing, as we see in this report from WDHN's Mike Gerspan. With temperatures dropping, many low-income residents must decide whether to spend their money on food, rent, or utilities. Former Samson Councilman and Pastor James Rutland was joined by several other area clergy members and an army of volunteers who prepared the Christmas meal. And with the pandemic going on around us now, there's a lot of them don't even have food to put on their table, can't even buy gifts for their kids. So our goal is to give them a hot Christmas dinner and also give them a gift bag to go with those meals. With so many low-income residents losing their jobs in the service industry due to the coronavirus, folks are silently hurting out there. They're cold and hungry right here in the Wiregrass. Well, during this time, you know, a lot of people have struggled with trying to provide and keep food on the tables, and we just feel like if we can just help them with a little something and bring a little joy this holiday season, that that's well worth it for us. Unfortunately, the church ran out of food, but Reverend Rutland is planning similar community meals. And that was Mike Grispan reporting that, in fact, Reverend Rutland says beginning in January, his congregation will begin feeding the community twice a month or until after the COVID pandemic breaks. Wouldn't that be the day? Up next, Oscar's extended Christmas weather forecast and an Adopt-A-Pet segment we taped last week with Denise Hammonds and Sam, the kitten with more than one name who wouldn't mind getting another. Don't go away. We'll be right back. taped pet segment. So what you could do, <clears throat> yeah, there you go. Um, gang, I'm going to move on over to the set. Can he, well, I need him to put up the supers for Mr. Mayhaw. Perfect. Great, great, great. Excellent. Okay. So we also would like somebody to run prompter and please be queued up especially on my lead in to the live guest sure after the after the break perfect thank you mm -hmm.
This weather segment is sponsored by Physicians Hearing Center. You're watching WDHN's First Alert Weather. Meteorologist Oscar Fan in for Ted King, who's enjoying his Christmas. As far as what we're looking at for today, the talking points, sunny, but it will be cold and got breezy here, but at times it will be windy up near 20, but generally speaking, it will be around 13 to 15 miles an hour out of the west northwest to northwest. Christmas night tonight, very cold, clear. Winds will die down to less than 10 miles an hour, but temperatures will drop down to around 23 to 26 for Saturday morning. As we get into Saturday, high still will be in the 40s, getting to the upper 40s after a high today around 43. And then Saturday night, Sunday morning, temperatures in the upper 20s yet again. And then we finally start a slight warm up but staying dry all the way through Tuesday. Clouds increase late Tuesday, especially into Wednesday. And then somewhere along between Wednesday afternoon towards sunset and Thursday morning, we'll have yet another front similar to the last one. And this one has the potential to have some strong thunderstorms. Again, about an inch to probably inch and a half of rain. And then we settle down January 1st, 2nd and 3rd, look to be on the seasonably cool side uh, and dry. Uh, otherwise, Merry Christmas, and I hope you're having a good one with good food, family, friends, and good conversations. Temperature 30 degrees. Notice that west southwest wind, a little, uh, not for a seam, but that's the reason we've seen the temperature hold up a degree or two. Uh, dew point is at 21. By the way, the air is really dry. You bring that air in from the outside, you heat it, it gets even drier. And that's why you sometimes start to have sore throats, nasal difficulties, and all that, because it is an irritant to your more or less your lungs and your breathing capabilities. Temperatures around the area pretty much in the upper 20s to the low 30s and everybody will be at freeze including the coast for tomorrow morning. Temperatures around the country you can see uh, pretty much what you might expect for late December and anybody complaining in the past few years about it's too mild doesn't feel like Christmas well we won't hear that complaint this year. This is what we're looking at as far as satellite radar the activities moving away it did have some strong thunderstorms and severe ones in coastal Carolinas and parts of eastern Georgia over toward Brunswick and Savannah and now you see that activity moving up. And again, it is a little bit warmer up in up parts of New England because that front hasn't made it there, but it will be making it there and they all get their cold temperatures as well as we are. In fact, they're obviously, they will be colder. Hour by hour over the next two, two and a half days, nothing. Uh, don't even see any clouds really coming into the area. Uh, again, maybe a few high clouds by the time we get to Tuesday and that's about it. So today looking for a high getting up to around 43 degrees. Uh, winds will be breezy, even gusty at times, but they'll start to settle down later this afternoon. And overnight lows will drop down to around 23 to 26 degrees. Northwest wind around 10 early in the evening, settling down to single digits. And the extended forecast shows uh, things improve. It's a dry forecast until we get to Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, another inch, inch and a half plus of rain. Uh, and then again, first part of the year will be on the seasonally cool side, but dry. Amanda. Here we go, another Friday, another <laughs> pet to adopt another. here. Welcome, Denise. Hi. Denise Hammonds from the Dothan Animal Shelter, and this time she has brought Sam. 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 Hello, Sam. This Sam is a lively little dude, and he's how old, we think? He's close to three months. He's just almost three months. Okay. <laughs> he's he, yes, he is, Sam is uh, one of the kittens that has been part of our foster program that we have okay. uh, with the Animal Shelter and, and Save a Pet, and he's actually been in a foster home uh, since he was pretty young, so he has been very well socialized with kids, other cats, dogs. He is obviously very active. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's a curious. He's definitely, but curiosity kill the cat. Yes. But curiosity makes this cat a lot livelier than many we've had here. <laughs> and, and what's interesting in, about the foster program is that the last time this dog, I mean this cat, was uh, was related to a, a, a pet that we had on named Bruce. Right. So we had Bruce Wayne. Uh -huh. And this former life was Wayne. Was Wayne. That was his previous name in a yep. previous life. But when they go to foster care. The fosters get to name him whatever they want to name him. And this one is Sam. He became Sam. He and then, became Sam. And then the fosters, of course, do their part and they give him back after right. he's old enough. Mm -hmm. And so here we are. And, and Sam is now looking for a permanent home. And I bet if people wanted, they could name Sam whatever they wanted. And they could name Sam whatever they wanted. Because he's not totally attached to that name. No, no. <laughs> he's so cute. Well, listen, what else is in need at the animal shelter? Well, it, because it's getting cold, obviously, we still are in great need uh, of blankets and towels, um, as well as we can always use canned dog food and canned cat food. Okay. All righty. And so basically, we just want to make sure
sure that little Sam, maybe by Christmas time, can have a new family. That's right. And a new family can have a new little adorable, lively uh, pet of their own to call Sam or whatever you choose, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, listen, we want to thank you again. Thank and, you. And Sam, listen, you know what I like about Sam? He's a happy, he's happy, he's purring. <laughs> he's purring, he's so sweet. He's so sweet and happy. And he blends right in with the new little decoration here yes. with our tree. We want to thank <laughs> Dillard's for providing our decorations here in the studio. And uh, Sam, Sam. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> There's a home out there waiting just for you, just in time for Christmas. I know it. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, you talk to me. You're not really talking to the camera. That's like a third person, but you, you and I are having this conversation. Sure. I may, we may occasionally refer to... And welcome back. This Christmas morning, our studio guest is the Director of Spiritual Care at Southeast Health. And Timothy Mayhall is a board certified chaplain with the Association of Professional Chaplains, a 1999 graduate of the University of Alabama in History and English, who earned his Master of Divinity from the Beeson Divinity School at Samford University in Birmingham. All those credentials aside, working with with him for years in monthly meetings of Dothan's interfaith spiritual group. I know Chaplain Mayhall to be a man with a compassionate heart for helping those who are hurting and those in need of encouragement. So welcome Tim Mayhall and Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Amanda. Thank you so much for, for being here this morning and thank you also to your family <laughs> for sparing you for a few moments so that you can provide your unique blend of, of comfort, wisdom and inspiration at a time in a year when so many need it so badly. Very glad to be here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. What are some of the challenges that you are facing uh, with dealing with this very unique, unprecedented time? Oh, well, uh, when we talk about spiritual care, uh, we are talking about the way uh, that people make meaning of their lived experiences, um, how they make sense of the world and uh, their experiences in that world. And some of the 
resources that we have for doing that are inside of us. We have uh, all of us, beliefs, values, um, uh, personal interpretations of reality. Uh, but uh, a lot of those resources are outside of us. We have important relationships. Um, we have a work that we do that gives our life meaning. Um, I am a husband and a father. Those are important relationships for me. Um, we have habits and hobbies. These things connect us uh, to others, to our world. Um, human beings are designed beautifully uh, to connect with one another. Um, if we sit and talk for 10 or 15 minutes, our, our breaths come into sync, our hearts beat together. Um, we're designed to be together in physical space and, and COVID disrupts that. Mm -hmm. um, it keeps us apart in many ways and it will use that strength against us if we gather. Um, so unless we seek out uh, new, safe and available ways of connecting with one another, uh, we can experience um, increased feelings of, of isolation, of anxiety, of sorrow. Um, that can impact our, uh, our resilience and our ability to cope with the gains and losses of life. Well, so resilience, you know, is the key, and how do we strengthen that? Right, we talk a lot about resilience in healthcare. Uh, resilience means our ability to recover from injury or insult. When something happens to us, how quickly can we get back up, can we get on our feet um, uh, when a trouble comes, and troubles always come. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time they pass, sometimes they stay with us or they change us. Um, but how do we move forward together? How do we endure troubles, overcome them, heal, and go forward together? Um, in the hospital, for example, um, COVID has been a, a relentless trouble. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to find a moment to process a painful loss. Um, nurses and doctors, they, they tend to be really good connectors. Sure. That's part of what draws them to that work. And, COVID patients tend to be with us longer and, and sometimes their families aren't there so we have to uh, step in and act emotionally as um, on their behalf and um, we form deep connections with these patients and when we have a loss for example and that can be very painful. Uh, we always say that we're not just professionals caring for professionals, we're people caring for people. Um, but we don't have time to stop um, and grieve, uh, we have to move on to the next patient. So. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do in the hospital is build hesitations, moments um, uh, of pause where a caregiver after a difficult loss can um, go ahead, continue. Can, can take a moment to uh, process that, to shed a tear. We've built oasis rooms. Oh, how um, wonderful. Yeah, they're uh, quiet rooms, uh, just a comfortable chair, um, warm lighting, um, a place where they can go uh, and not be interrupted uh, for just 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and just think and, and feel um, and then move forward with their work. And you've also had a tremendous amount of community support. We just have a few seconds left, but could you speak yeah. to that for a moment? Oh, our community has been amazing. <laughs> and this is our community. We're one of the last true community hospitals. Um, uh, we have thousands of cards in the hospital that have been written. Uh, we hang them up and they mean so much to us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Wiregrass Church did a live music Christmas concert for us in our parking lot. Oh, wow. All of these uh, expressions mean so much. We can't overestimate their value. Well, listen, I can't overestimate the value of your being here this morning and sharing these thoughts and, and comfort and, and uh, strength with us. And again, thank you to your family. And most of all, thank you for what you do. Thank you. It's got to be tough on you. And uh, you obviously have some inner resources that we can all benefit from as well. Thank you again. We'd love to have you back here on Wake Up Wiregrass. And Anytime. we'd like to have you stay with us because we'll be right back with Oscar's final weather and more when we come back. Stay with us.
be careful out on area lakes today. Uh, it will be dry and sunny, but there will be winds still around 15 to 20 miles an hour and awfully chilly. Highs only in the lower 40s. Quick look at the extended forecast. Dry forecast starting to warm up a little bit late in the weekend. As we get into the middle of next week, late Wednesday into Thursday, more rain, yet possible strong thunderstorms at that time. Again, have a very Merry Christmas, Amanda. All right, Oscar, thank you, and same to you. Well, finally this morning, just to let you know that after this long and difficult year, Santa has now brought his special brand of joy to children all over the world. But beforehand, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Santa was not able to sit close with the children this year as he usually does. He too had to wear his mask and keep a healthy social distance, but he still showed up and made sure to listen to what children who came to see him wanted this year. And then before he got underway delivering toys and gifts, Santa said he's grateful he was able to see so many kids despite the coronavirus. Really good. I'm just as ready as I could be. <laughs> yes, I am. So the, uh, the the reindeer and everything is all they're, they're all resting and getting ready for the big for the big moment. He said ready for the big moment and now after the big moment, after visiting all those houses and apartments and dwellings, while still wearing his mask to stay safe and keep others safe, Santa and his reindeer are enjoying some well-deserved rest. So thank you, Santa. Well done, sir. Until next year. And thank you for joining us this special Christmas morning. We hope you have a wonderful day. We'll see you back here on Monday. Thanks.